and welcome to the March Planetarian Zoom seminar. The, today, we have Noreen Grice, uh, and she's speaking on um, the title of her talk is Using Tactile Images to Make Planetariums More Accessible for Blind and Visually Impaired Learners. So uh, without, without delay, Noreen. Well, thank you, Al, and thank you for inviting me to, to speak with you today. I am going to uh, bring on a PowerPoint, so let me share my screen. Let's see. And it will go to this. Okay, everybody see the slides? Yes. Good, okay. So we're gonna talk about using tactile images to make planetariums more accessible for blind and visually impaired learners. So I am um, founder and president of You Can Do Astronomy, and I'm a consultant in helping planetariums and schools, um, educational institutions make their um, astronomy programs more accessible, accommodating and welcoming to people with uh, disabilities. And my primary focus has been on accessibility for blind and visually impaired learners. Um, so my website is www.youcandoastronomy.com. Now, I think many of you know my story, but I like to tell it anyway, because it's, it's, uh, it's important to me. It's, uh, I have some great memories. My work in accessibility began in the planetarium. It wasn't something I had thought about. It was something that happened to me one day. So back in 1984, which seems like yesterday, <laughs> I was an astronomy major at Boston University, um, working part-time at the Boston Museum of Science in the Charles Hayden Planetarium. And I was only on the job for maybe about a month or so. Um, and one day a group of blind students came to the planetarium. And that's a day that really changed my life and it completely changed my career. Um, what happened was the students uh, came to the planetarium. You know, I didn't know what to do. The manager on duty told me that I should help them to their seats, which I did. And then it was a pre-recorded show. So I pressed the button on the Apple IIe computer and the show did its thing. And then I sat in the console and at the end of the program, I wondered what the group thought about the program. So um, as they approached the console, I came around and asked them how they liked the show. And I expected they would say, yeah, it was okay. But that's not what they said. They didn't like it at all because it was not accessible. It, it never occurred to me that astronomy was not accessible until this group pointed that out to me. It was not accessible because the images were projected on the dome overhead and the planetarium program was not particularly descriptive. It was like, and over here's the Big Dipper and over there's the Ring Nebula and over here is Saturn, but there wasn't any description. So it wasn't until I took a trip to the Perkins School for the Blind Library and spoke to the librarian about what was available for astronomy that I found that there wasn't a lot. There was um, a big bookshelf of Isaac Asimov books, very thick with Braille. Um, I didn't know Braille at the time, but I knew it was Braille, but they didn't have any pictures. And I asked the librarian if Braille books have any touchable pictures. And the librarian said not very many Braille books did have touchable pictures because they're very labor intensive and very expensive to make. So then it occurred to me, well, maybe I can do something about making astronomy more accessible. I don't really know how I'm gonna do it or what to do, but I'm gonna think about it. And I started out thinking that I would write a, maybe a brochure about astronomy and I would call it Touch the Stars, but that ended up to become a book. It became my first book um, published by the Museum of Science, which contained 42 pages of text in Braille and 10 tactile images, and that was back in 1990. Um, it was actually sold through the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and Sky and Telescope Magazine and the Museum of Science. And um, within a year, uh, just by word of mouth, it sold out. And so my, my, my goal really was to always make planetarium, um, the planetarium more accessible by having tactile images for every show. And that's how I started out deciding on what the images would be for Touch the Stars. So while I was working on Touch the Stars, I was making like little picture booklets to go along with all the planetarium shows. 
And so as more images were created, they were expanded and, and included in Touch the Stars into the second edition and the third edition. Um, so I started out actually making the pictures by hand, etching them uh, on plastic sheets. And that was very time consuming. I That's what I understood why uh, images were expensive and time consuming because you had to make them one at a time. And so I got a braille embosser and that's how I made the first images for Touch the Stars with a braille embosser and using an Apple IIe computer. Now, as a result of that, uh, a professor happened to see Touch the Stars in a bookstore in Chicago and contacted me and asked if there was anything like that for the Hubble Space Telescope. And there wasn't, but we decided to apply for a grant to get some money. We got the grant and that is what paid for Touch the Universe, a NASA Braille book of astronomy. So that was my first NASA book and it had images from the Hubble Space Telescope um, in 2002. And then that led to someone else from NASA contacting me. Oh, it's too bad there isn't something like that for the sun. So there became Touch the Sun, a NASA Braille book in 2005. And then um, different groups got together and said, there should be something about different wavelengths, observing in different wavelengths that can't be seen by human eyes. And that was Touch the Invisible Sky, a multi-wavelength braille book featuring tactile NASA images with images from Chandra and Hubble and radio images. And so that all came together. Now, in addition to the books, I've been involved in some projects that include tactile images, tactile image design. For example, with Chandra, I've designed tactile image panels for um, several exhibits, including um, from the earth to the solar system and here, there and everywhere and light beyond the bulb. And so it's a series of um, tactile panels that people request from Chandra. And also it's those the images that people, um, just for visual images, people print out and then create their own uh, exhibit at their own facility. Um, I worked on the Solar System Radio Explorer kiosk, which then became an exhibit at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, I designed the tactile Carina Nebula poster for the Hubble, with the Hubble Space Telescope. And that was really difficult because when I, first looked at that image, I was like, wow, I, it, it was, there was so much going on. And then I had to sit with the scientists and go through the different parts of the picture. So I really understood it. And then I could um, put textures to it and explain what those different parts were. And then I've also worked with a group um, from the Space Telescope Science Institute on tactile graphic design using 3D printers of NGC 602. So the basic question is, what is a tactile image? A tactile image is a touchable raised picture that is designed to be explored with the fingertips. Um, and in the tactile images I work on, I like to uh, assign different textures to represent different aspects of the tactile image. So on the left is uh, the prototype I use for the tactile Carina Nebula. And on the right is a close-up of a student touching the side panel of the Solar System Radio Explorer kiosk. A lot of people, um, a lot of people might think, okay, so you have a tactile picture, and then you hand it to somebody and say, "Oh yeah, here you go," <laughs> and then the person who's receiving it was, you know, will think, "Well, what is it?" So a tactile picture can't just be handed over. You need to really explain what the tactile image is. You need to provide the background, the interpretation to help the person understand what the tactile image is. So for example, in this picture, this is when I was testing out different sizes of the Carina Nebula. Originally, the Carina Nebula poster was gonna actually be a very large poster like, eight feet by 10 feet. So I made a version like that. And then I made a smaller version. I think it was like three by five feet. And then just by chance, I took the um, the 11 by 17 sheet that I worked off of and I brought it with me. And it turned out that it was the smaller image that people liked because when I had the bigger image, there was empty space between the objects and people got lost. 
And that's something I hadn't considered until we tried it. But in all the cases and all the different sizes, what I would do is sit with the evaluator and pictorially describe the image and invite the learner to explore the tactile image. So they would hear a description and they would be touching that part. And so it's kind of an immersive experience by touch. And so sometimes a person might say, can you help me explore this image? And so there's a, there's a, a technique called hand over hand. So with permission or by request, you can guide the person's fingertips in a tour of the image. So in this picture, the person has their hand on the image and my hand is on top, guiding that person to different parts of the picture. So you always wanna ask permission or respond by their request to do that. Now, an example of a pictorial description, instead of handing somebody a picture of Saturn and say, yeah, here's Saturn. How about instead saying, hand the person the picture of Saturn or help them explore it and describe, this is a tactile image of the planet Saturn. The rings of Saturn look like a loose fitting belt around the planet. The billions of ring particles that encircle Saturn are made of ice and rock and range in size from tiny rocks to objects larger than a house. So now you are painting a picture in the person's mind and you're helping them explore the shape, you know, size and scope of the object. So, you know, Touch the Stars was my first book and it is now actually in its fifth edition with 113 pages and 19 tactile images. And the images include objects that you would find in any planetarium program, just about anything. Uh, for example, star patterns, moon phases, eclipses, planets, a comet, a meteor shower, nebulae, star cluster, galaxy. And so you'll notice around the edge of this picture, somebody has made little tabs so they can quickly turn to the page. So somebody has written, you know, deep space, Milky Way, Comet, Saturn, Jupiter, let's see, solar system, lunar eclipse, uh, solar eclipse. And the person did that because many planetariums have a copy of Touch the Stars and they have it ready. So if somebody comes to the planetarium unexpected, they pull out the book and turn to the page that will relate to that planetarium program. And so hopefully there'll be more than one page, but it's a resource that's quick and you can uh, pull it out fast. And the text pages are in print in Braille on the same page. So a person who is a Braille reader can, you know, read for some in information, maybe before or after the program, and you know what it says, so you can turn to the correct page. So that's kind of a, it is something that I hadn't thought of that people, I thought, you know, Touch the Stars would be a nice book for people to enjoy at home and learn about astronomy, but it turns out that it's become a tool for many planetariums just to have it available and just pull it out as needed. Another thing is uh, you might've noticed some of my postings on Dome L, um, tactile star images. And so people are using tactile star images with solar viewing, especially for the upcoming eclipse to have that available so that you can um, share that with people and say, you know, the sun has some sunspots today. This is the comparison of sunspots on the you know, the solar disk, or there is a prominence, or, you know, the sun is very active today, and, and the surface of the sun is very active, uh, and here's some texture to kind of suggest the activity on the sun. If you have a star party at night, um, you can offer a tactile tour of the telescope. So this is a picture I took of, um, I did a star party with the National Federation of the Blind and the, um, I think it was the astronomical, it was like the Astronomical Society of Dallas came to the um, conference hotel and they brought telescopes and we had a star party. And so people who had some vision were able to look through the telescope, but everybody was able to touch the outside of the telescope guided by the person who uh, whose telescope that was. Another thing is to, you can bring 3D printed NASA models to the event and NASA has a website with, with models. If you have a 3D printer, you can print them out. And there are sites um, also online like Thingiverse where 
there's already other models created or there's companies or people who will print them out for you. So that's another possibility. Uh, tactile images can be used with sighted learners. And a lot of people don't realize that, but people have different learning styles. Um, sighted learners can touch the tactile images during the planetarium program. And that's what we did in an, a test at Western Connecticut State University some years ago where I was, it's just a Spitz A3P and I was just talking about the stars and we passed out tactile images and people were touching them while looking up. And, um, you know, we got comments that it, it was helpful and they learned in a different way. And I remember working in Boston with a, a coworker who had, you know, was new onto the job and I was explaining the console of the Zeiss. So this knob does this and this knob does that. And he said, wait a minute. And he had to put his hand on the knob. Now tell me what this knob does. And then he had to put his hand on the other knob. Tell me what this knob does. So it was, it, it was this learning style that was the combination of tactile and listening. And so I've, ne I've never forgotten that. And so this is just something else that you can, you can try with um, sighted visitors. Everybody likes to touch something and it, it doesn't hurt to try a different approach in inputting information and making it even more active uh, while people are in the planetarium. And also we've tried using a tactile images with sighted learners at the telescope. So um, one, the picture on the left is somebody is waiting in line to get a chance to look through the telescope. So they are touching a picture of Saturn, a tactile picture of Saturn while waiting in line. So they have an idea of what to expect, okay, kind of a preview. And then the picture on the right is someone simultaneously looking through the telescope and touching a picture of the moon. So that, that is another um, strategy to try. So in summary, tactile images are useful for blind, visually impaired, and sighted learners. Tactile images are important resources to have available in a museum, the planetarium, at star parties, and for outreach events. And that's mean be, being proactive, not waiting for somebody to say, um, I need a, a, a resource and you to think, oh, if I had only kn known that in advance, or maybe I could have got something. But if you always have something available, you just pull it out and, the, you know, there it is. So you want to be inclusive and proactive, have resources available at all times. And you want to be welcoming, pictorially descriptive, and inspiring, because we all want to inspire people who come to the planetarium, and we want them to love astronomy in the same way that we do. So with that, this is the, this is the last slide. Again, my website is www.youcandoastronomy.com. And I will end that with any questions. So let me stop sharing here. Let's see. And now, I don't know if there's a lot of questions. I haven't been looking at the chat. I've been <laughs> looking uh, at the screen. That's, that's wonderful, Noreen. That was a beautifully concise, great presentation. Thank you. And uh, I think we do have a number of questions. Um, by the way, I forgot to I forgot to say at the very beginning to for people, if you came in late, put your name and where you're from in the chat for our attendance list. That's our the attendance list is the chat. And Jeff, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Noreen. Uh, I had I hadn't heard that story before, so so thank you for sharing it. But my first question is, do you did you actually ask what made that first group actually come to the planetarium in the first place? Uh, like, did they did they think they were going to get a different experience than they got? Or was there some sort of marketing push or, or whatever? I don't think there was. Uh, at that time, um, the Museum of Science, you know, it did. they didn't have an IMAX theater. It was the planetarium and it was, you know, it was 50 cents extra <laughs> to go to the planetarium back then. So my suspicion is that they didn't come for, but they just came to see, you know, what it was about and it was part of the admission. Uh, but I felt really bad. I, I mean, when they walked away disappointed, I felt double disappointed because it just, I, you know, everybody thinks the planet terms the most wonderful place in the world. I mean, why wouldn't it be? But it wasn't. And and that really bothered me. I just, I just couldn't let it go. I just had to try to figure out some way to, to resolve the problem and to, to make it better. And that's, 
that's really what I've dedicated myself from that moment on. I've dedicated myself to making astronomy more accessible. Yeah, can you, I can imagine what that would be like. I mean, even even today when I give a bad show, it's like, oh, I feel really bad. <laughs> um, but then, um, then this goes back to a conversation we had earlier in terms of the vicious cycle of planetariums aren't perceived as accessible to the visually impaired. So nobody comes, so nobody asks, so no, so we don't dedicate resources to it. Is there any sort of research or or best tips and practices in terms of breaking that vicious cycle other than just saying, you know, hey, we, we have a, a visually impaired accessible show for people? Uh, I Well, my personal feeling is that um, a lot of people are afraid to, to do the wrong thing. So they're afraid to just try something. Um, and And I think that's actually what that's what the situation was in Boston when I first started, because it seemed that if there was somebody who was, and it wasn't a lot of blind people coming, but if there was somebody who was blind, it seemed like the staff was going in the opposite direction. And I was like, wait a minute, you know, and when I started working on the pictures, I actually sought out if there was a blind person walking in the plant, in the museum, I like ran after them. And I said, wait a minute, could you, could you help me? And, Every time somebody, the person would say, yes, I would be very happy to help you. And we'd sit on a bench and, and I'd show them some of the prototype pictures I was working on. So I think that people are just uh, afraid to do the wrong thing, but don't, don't be afraid to do the wrong thing. Um, ask people, what do you need? How can we make this better? And if you can actually form a connection with a local group, maybe it's the National Federation of the Blind local chapter, maybe it's the uh, State Association for the Blind, or you know, even individuals who come in, if you can make a connection with them and have, have them available for as a focus group, they will tell you what will work. And then you can um, make your way toward making, getting to that point so that things work for them and things work for you and everybody feels good about it. And then I see so many other hands and I don't want to take up too much time, but my, my last real quick, quick question is, do you have any um, even anecdotal data about the spectrum of a vision that's, that's there? I know, you, I know it's, I know it's a spectrum. Some people can see none at all. Some people can see some, um, but do you have any data or numbers to, to tell us like what we should be looking out for in terms of if we see somebody walking through how, what are some things that we can tell and, and what are some numbers that we can have in our heads about what are the chances that this person is is completely blind or or partially or whatever yeah it's 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 not it's not that cut and dry but i mean there's like six million visually impaired people in america and that can range from as you say somebody you know wearing corrective glasses i mean if i don't have my glasses on you all you're all blurry to me at the computer screen right now um but it could be somebody um you know has a medical condition, diabetes, where they're losing their sight. Somebody could have retinitis pigmentosa, where they have like tunnel vision. Somebody could lose peripheral vision. Uh, if you see somebody walking with a cane or a guide dog, then you know they they definitely need assistance. Uh, I think you I, the best thing to do is to ask the person and don't like run up and startle the person. The best thing is if you you know, approach the person, introduce yourself, or if you're not sure if they have seen you, maybe lightly put your hand on their shoulder or something and say, hello, you know, my name's Noreen, I work here in the planetarium, uh, could you help, could you help me? People never get asked, could could they help you? And they and people do want to help. They just never get asked. They, you know, people make assumptions, oh, here's the thing for you, but it's really best to ask them what will work for them. Right. Uh, yeah, there are a bunch more questions here. <laughs> David, uh, David, it's good to see you. Uh, you're next. You need to unmute. <laughs> David, you need to unmute. Okay, can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, great. I'm, I'm doing this from a, uh, my, my girlfriend here is at a rehab place. So I'm doing this on the fly here. So let me know if I, you don't hear me or something. Um, I had a question for two questions for Noreen, if I could. Um, first of all, uh, Noreen, thank you for doing this presentation. It's exactly what we need. Uh, two questions. Number one, you mentioned an embosser. I'm wondering if there is an embosser that would allow illustrations to be 
made tactile that one could buy? And what would you recommend there? That's my first question. The second question is, Noreen, are you aware of any devices, electronic devices, where you can input a picture and have these raised pins comes up where the people could put their hands on it and feel the raised pins to represent an image? Okay, so your first question about embossers, it's not it's not that easy that you can, I mean, there, there are companies that sell embossers for like 10, 20, $30,000. And yeah, it's really cost prohibitive, but it's not just that, you know, just changing, you know, printing out a picture. There's usually some design work involved because if you put too much in a picture, people get lost in there's too many details. And that that's actually one thing I learned while working on Touch the Universe, uh, because I made prototypes of all these Hubble pictures and there was the picture of the Northern Deep Field and I race up every galaxy and people said, I don't understand this. What is all this? You know, it's too much. And I had to start removing galaxies and they said less is more. So it required it, it required design work. So there isn't there isn't anything like, you know, hit print and it prints out and you're done. That, um, that's not that's not quite there yet. As far as the device with the pins, um, actually, there the American um, Printing House for the Blind is working on a device called the Monarch, which kind of looks like an etch a sketch, and currently it's about fifty thousand dollars, <laughs> because mm. yeah, because every one of those pins are on an actuator that that right. there's just a lot of um, you know physical mechanism involved. So we're not there yet, but people are trying to get to that point. And again, what is the name of the uh, of the uh, association that's doing this work on the Monarch? The American, I believe it's the American Printing House for the Blind. Great. Right. Uh, there was, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, APH, American Printing House for the Blind. Okay. Uh, there was a device that I saw advertised um, about a year ago. It was actually appeared in a um, electronics magazine, a, a iMac for the, for the Macs. Uh, for, for Apple, and it was a device that uses ultra ultrasonics, where it was designed to be more of an entertainment thing. But I started to wonder about this. You put your hand over this device, and it sends out inter, uh, ultrasonic pulses that you could feel. I don't know what the resolution of it was, but I started thinking that might be something interesting. I don't know if you've run across that device at all. Uh, well, I've run across. I, I someone showed me something like that on an iPad where you touch different areas and there was a slight vibration. I didn't feel that it was enough of a vibration, but I think that there's still some work going on it. So, you know, it has potential. Anything has potential, and it has to be thoroughly tested with the user to really mm -hmm. identify whether it will be successful and useful for them. Okay, so I guess the takeaway here is that these embossers and so forth are really uh, might be kind of price prohibitive for those of us working with limited budgets in, in community colleges, for example, as I do or did. And uh, well, it might be better to buy your books but have all the work already done. Well, that's right. That's right. Because if you can get the embosser, you still, it's just not a, I know, a print picture. There's, there's got to be some design work involved. So yeah, you, okay. it still, there still needs to be some human intervention between the picture and the result. Uh, editing, I guess, is the word that comes to my mind. Yeah. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, for answering my questions and for doing yeah. this presentation. Yeah. I think Julie, Julie, you're you're uh, you're next. If you want to unmute. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, first, loved this talk. This is amazing. We have actually one of your books here at the Science Center. Viola. That's where I work. Uh, no idea it was by you. No idea you were the one doing this talk. So excited about that. Um, we've been using it for our star parties, and I would really like to use that as well as some of your other work in our planetarium. Um, and one of my major like wonderings, I guess, is how many of each like copy do you think you would need on average? Because like we can have probably 150-ish people in our planetarium, uh, more if they squish. Um, and so how many copies do you feel like we would need to properly, like how many groups could have one book, for example, um, and have it be a really quality experience for them? So is it Touch the Stars that you have? Yes. So, I mean, I think the two people can share a copy, you know, easily between them. But I think it's tough if you have more than that, because physically just being able to shift the book back and forth. 
Um, so, you know, I, I, I would say a few copies anyway, because unless you're going to get, unless you, you've got a, um, a reservation for a school for the blind, you're probably only going to have, you know, a few people at a time, maybe a family or some friends. So you might have, you know, five people at a time, but I, I just think if you, even if you have a your capacity of a hundred people, it would be unlikely that you would have a hundred blind people all at once, unless there was a, a conference in town from a you know group of blind people coming in. You know what I mean? I just think that just in general, you probably would have like two to five people at one time. You know, speaking of, go ahead. Uh, so I guess my follow-up question to that is I, uh, we work a little bit, we're starting to work with more of the blind and deaf community here in Iowa, which is one of the reasons we decided to come to this talk today. But we also already have a connection with some of the special needs groups. And I know someone in the chat said they've worked with this, um, with the tactile experiences for special needs groups. And I'd love to hear if you have done that or if the person who said that in the chat want to speak to that experience a little. I'd like to hear how it worked and like how you went through it. Uh, I don't see the the comment in the chat. Do you mean Amy, working Amy with Gallagher? People? Oh, and Amy, oh Amy, I don't know. What, I have to go searching. There's a whole bunch of comments. Um, I can say that when I'm when I design tactile pictures, I work with um, people who are blind and visually impaired because I find it's it's very important to get their feedback. Unless I'm making a picture that is very similar to something else that I've already done and has been tested, uh, I will you know gather a group of people. Um, and it's usually I, I'm I'm a member of the uh, local the Central Connecticut chapter of the National Federation of the Blind. I I just stepped off the board so some other people could get on, but uh, you know I, I meet I I socialize with these people. I meet with them. I I see them once a month. And if I have a project, they're very happy to sit and and we talk about the pictures. And I tell them what you know the uh, strategy is for making the picture. And they'll tell me if it's if something needs to be changed. It's not right. But that's the important thing to work with the group that you want to serve. And I was the one who put in the chat that I have lots of special needs groups. Mm -hmm. And I do. We have, oh my gosh, probably twice a month, uh, a special needs group visiting. And it could be um, preschoolers. It could be, uh, we often get a lot of um, special needs adult groups that come through. So I have several copies of different versions of Noreen's books <laughs> and um, I'll pull out Touch the Stars. And while they are waiting to go into the planetarium theater, I, I let them explore the books and uh, we've got some 3D printed models of things. I've got two of the tactile images from NASA. So I don't like to just like, like Noreen said, you don't just hand it over to somebody and say, here, enjoy. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely much more effective if you're able to say, feel these pillars reaching up like fingers and um, you know things like that, do, do a little bit of description. So I, I tried to bring out a couple of things and let the folks and their their counselors share share the, the books before we go into the theater. Yeah, that and sounds I'll like- And jump in. And, 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 you know, back up Noreen and, and Amy and just say that that's a good strategy for even if you have sighted people and you're showing them a picture, you don't just show them a picture and say, good, enjoy, right? That's <laughs> not, that's yeah. not a good way to, to teach somebody about space. Um, so, so just in general, I would, I would say that's a, that's a good thing. And then, um, you know, going back to David's point and, and my, it's kind of a question for Noreen too, in terms of, you mentioned 3D printers a little bit um, and NASA does have a whole bunch of stuff and, you know, Chandra has, has their own 3D printed nebula and whatever. But, uh, and, and I see Rosemary has a question in the, in the chat of, if we're just do, making something simple, like a constellation or whatever, what has your, your experience been in terms of just 3D printing something simple and easy, not like a, a braille quality book, but just something that people can touch and interact with. And just in general, whether you're sighted or not, I find that that's really helpful in terms of tactile um, engagement. Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is that the very first picture, tactile picture I made was the Big Dipper. And I was so proud. I had, you know, my stars and connecting the the pattern. And when I showed it to a blind student, you know, he's like, I don't understand. What what are all these A's? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, 
the A's. What are you doing? What is all the A's? And it, you know, it was like one going back. I'm like, I don't understand. Well, one single dot in Braille is a letter A. So I had a lot of A's on the page and I didn't tell people that the dot represented a star until the student said, you have to tell people about that. Otherwise they're gonna think this is alphabet soup here. So I, I learned something right away. It, and also I learned about um, captions. Like I've had the Big Dipper, you know, the picture and then below it, the Big Dipper, just like you'd see in a book, but that's not how people read. People read from top down. And so I learned, oh, I have to put the caption on the top so people know, okay, this is the title of the picture. Now let me explore the picture. So getting things and and that's so and that actually goes back to what you were asking about Jeff like why do people get caught in the um situation where you know we don't have something we're sorry we don't have something because people are afraid it's okay to make mistakes you learn from your mistakes I I made mistakes and I'm really glad I did because I learned a lot and then I've never made those mistakes again and things have gotten better with my pictures and you know it's 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 been a good thing and then I see Amy's hand, but real quickly for Julie, um, have you guys tried sonifications in your dome? Because if you're doing a lot of people, like let's say you do have a conference of of, of visually impaired individuals, I, I, I'd, I'd wonder if you, you, had, you have tried sonifications at all before. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't, but that's a good point. I'm gonna write it down so I can look into that later. And I, I will add to it that I'm teaching a university astronomy class and I am using sonifications. When I introduce a, an image, I say, now let's hear a, a sonification of that image. So I've included it into my lectures. Okay, hey, Amy. Yeah, so um, when the James Webb images first came out, we were so excited. We printed a... 3D model of, if you can see it, a nebula. So the image that we see from James Webb is edge on, but this is fantastic for, for everybody to see that it's not just one dimensional, two dimensional. And um, everybody sighted and, and visually impaired visitors have enjoyed touching a couple of these that we have. So having models is great for everybody. Is that something you made, Amy? Yes. Well, like you made, the, you made the 3D model. <laughs> yeah, my coworker Kevin did it. Wow, okay. Yeah, so we printed it here. This is an acrylic print because that's what he had at the time. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to back up what Noreen said that, that these tactiles are, are great for everybody you know even when i'm just doing a presentation in general everyone loves touching stuff mm -hmm. it's just it's not just for the visually impaired it's a great draw especially like like if i'm doing like a steam night at a tabletop or whatever having a braille book and just having people come over and touch stuff is is a great way to, to draw people in yeah that that makes me think about when i was working on um let me grab it over here i have i have things next to me <laughs> but when i was working on touch the invisible sky um, I did some prototyping with uh, students at the National Federation of the Blind Youth Slam um, that was at Johns Hopkins back in 2007. And I, I think it was, you know, we might have been looking at these pictures here, but anyway, they're in, they're in color and they're touchable. And I remember um, passing this out and, you know, people were exploring the images and I was just, I read the description that would go along with the images. And you know, some people were saying, "Oh, I I like I like this," or "I would change this." And one person said, "I really like the contrast in the color. I I can really see that, you know, because he was low vision." But then one other person said, "Hey, wait a minute! Are you saying these pictures are in color? You mean you mean sighted people can use our book?" And that was so profound to me that things had flipped. That a sighted person. And that was the whole idea of this book, that everybody would use it together. It wouldn't be the book for the blind, but it would be the book for everybody. And that's what even I think Touch the Stars is, because it's in print and Braille and touchable and has actually a little teacher's guide that's printed. It's a book for everybody. Everybody can touch the stars. Yeah, and I see Matt's hand, but just, just to add, you know, I, I once went to a museum in, in Italy that it was an art museum, but they had next to some of their paintings, they had a, a 3D printed relief 
of their painting so everyone could come in and touch. And you could tell that millions of people had touched this. It was just so worn and smoothed down. But yeah, it's 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 an amazing thing to to let people touch and whether you're sighted or not. And if you ever go to Athens, there is the Tactile Museum, which is in a little neighborhood and it has a little sign that says, um, donated by a group from New Hampshire. And it was fantastic. I thought it was even better than the National Museum. So those, these are places to check out. So uh, Matt Williamson put uh, some links in the chat. And uh, Matt, you have your hand up too. Hi, folks. Uh, Johnny McCall from Scotland. Um, very happy that you folks shared the invitation to the British Association of Planetaria. I'm uh, a little portable dome based in Dundee. Um, and I'm very new to tactiles and sonification, but the links I've dumped in the chat there, um, the key contact this, um, this side of the world is Chris Harrison at the University of Newcastle in the northeast of England. Um, and um, the project we're hoping is funded um, come the autumn is to make resources like these for planetariums around the UK. Um, my sort of uh, statement is, hello, we're doing this too, um, get in touch. Um, but my, my question for Noreen is, um, do you have any more advice about if you're asking a fabricator to 3D print things for you, are there more subtleties? Because I've heard things like sighted people want very rough tactiles, whereas people who are completely blind um, almost get seasick if they're running their fingers over things that are very raised. So they need um, much less uh, contrast in the z-axis. Have you got any tips like that you could share? I can speak from experience on working on the um, the 3D project with the Space Telescope Science Institute. We made two versions of NGC uh, 602 and one was more of a flat version and one was more of a raised curve version. And what we found is that people who were previously sighted and had lost their sight preferred the flatter version and people who were blind from birth preferred the more raised and contoured version. And so we, we ended up with the two versions. And that's the thing that um, you know, as mentioned earlier, uh, visual impairment not only is a spectrum of ability, but it's also a spectrum of your experience. So somebody who has lost their sight, you know, may remember color and they remember maybe remember what different things look like. And a person who has been blind from birth what they may have difficulty with is perspective, looking at things from different angles where we might say, oh, you know, I, I see a table and the table is facing this way or that way. But a person who has been blind their whole life needs to, you know, look at things in 3D or if it's a 2D image, really emphasizing the perspective. That's where I think the disconnect gets in with somebody who has um, been blind their whole life and you're trying to explain um, things from different angles and getting that perspective. So th these, are, these are challenges that I have personally experienced in making different tactile uh, models. But as far as uh, roughness or smoothness, I think that you need to just have a focus group and ask people and, you know, you don't want to make a guess. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I think you're blind and you might like the smooth version, but you make, make multiple versions, pass them around and get people's, um, uh, feedback on it and see what yeah, they say. Don't, don't rush the prototyping. Right. You, you want it. You definitely want to involve people who will be the end user and, yeah. and make, make multiple versions and ask them which works for you. Explain what the model is supposed to be and the different parts of the model pictorially describe it and ask them, you know, what would you change? Does this make sense to you? And then keep iterating until you get it to a point where people say, okay, this totally makes sense because that's what yeah. I do when I'm working on a project. I'll make a design that I, I think will work, but then usually it's not quite finalized. And then there, there will be responses that I hadn't anticipated. And then I will make those changes and then we'll go back and say, now, what do you think about this? And sometimes it's one change. Sometimes it's four changes that are required. You never know. Yeah, no, good. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, 
just uh, I know there's been a couple of uh, comments from folks about uh, are there affordable ways to do this? Uh, the, I've not tried it myself, but the technique, what, it's a fairly quick and dirty technique um, called swell form printing. Uh, um, I, I know it. That's how I prototype my images. Ah, yeah, but, great. But that, yes, but that's also incurs a cost because the the machine that uh, first you need the paper, which is uh, the price of that paper has gone up. It used to be a dollar a sheet. Now it's a dollar twenty five a sheet. Mm. And then you have to run it through another machine that's about fifteen hundred dollars. So what I say is if you are looking for something that's cheap and you know inexpensive and fun, just take a trip to your local craft store and walk up and down the aisles and you will find things, maybe it's styrofoam balls, and also your local uh, like Lowe's or Home Depot. Sometimes I need to make something, and but I don't know what I need. And I'm walking up and down aisles, and then I'm seeing wires and tubes. Oh, that's just what I need, you know. And yeah. that's what you have to do. You have to go into these stores open-minded and just look. And, and then usually the inspiration will come to you on how to make something. Yeah, that's great. No, thank you for that. We've got, uh, actually, I, there's a, a note in the chat uh, from Rosemary. Apparently, her dogs are really excited about this, uh, <laughs> this uh, conversation. Uh, but she asks, uh, how much does it cost to have a Braille printer so that it could just be used to make captions for a, ta for a tactile? Uh, so, well, that's a little tricky because you have to, um, you have to have software that will um, translate the text into braille and that that's um the braille has changed a little bit it used to be called literary braille and now it's unified english braille and so people use duxbury translation software but the best thing to do really would be to work with a, a braille transcriber unless you are making really you know like one word captions if you're making something that's a little bit longer or a full page, I, I think it's best to work with a Braille transcriber on that rather than to try to, to to get an embosser yourself to do it. Unless you want to be certified in Braille transcription, you could do that. That's I think it's a free course through the Hadley School for the Blind. Okay, Carl, you're up. Yeah, so um, actually, uh, I think uh, you answered my my question. I was, I was really curious about how you did things like a uh, prototypes. So something really quick. Uh, I was thinking maybe you made something with plaster Paris or clay, and then put you know, like soft paper, uh, wetted paper over it or something, just to no. make images to 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 try out. No, um, actually, when I started working on the project uh, on NGC six hundred two, um, <laughs> I couldn't understand what the <laughs> I was having difficulty myself understanding the structure of the um, the cluster. So I went to the craft store and I got um, a, like a foam ball. It's not styrofoam, but like, um, I don't know what you call it, just foam. And I cut it out and I got some different uh, stickers and I put them in so that I could understand what it looked like. Because if I don't understand what it's like, then I can't make a translation uh, into a tactile form. As far as the swell form, um, actually, when the sometimes I do some outreach with the National Federation of the Blind, and there's a, a American with Disability Act celebration every year in New Britain, Connecticut, and so I help staff the table. And when the first image from um, Web came out, I used swell form and I made a tactile version, so which is raised up, and I put it in a protective sleeve. The problem with the swell form machine is great for um, prototyping, but the material, if you have a wet finger and you touch it, it erases the picture. Uh, it's very fragile and it can't be in humid conditions. And so that's why I generally just use it for prototyping. But in this case, I, I sort of made it back up here. I made a little, look, there we go. I made a little uh, display. So with the, uh, the tactile version versus the visual version. So I have a question. Um, the you meant you were talking about schools for the blind, you know, and the number of people who show up. Uh, have you have your products been dis been used at schools for the blind? I mean, apart from planetariums. Yes, yes. Um, so there's a lot of schools for the blind that do have touch the stars, 
And when the NASA books came out, um, Touch the Universe, Touch the Sun, and Touch the Invisible Sky, uh, part of that was that a certain amount were sent out to the schools for the blind and for the libraries for the blind. So every state has a library for the blind. And so those books may be there. Hopefully they haven't been deaccessioned, but they were sent out to every um, library for the blind in the US and most of the schools for the blind. Then I have one other question that's about captions, actually. Uh, you know, in the in a um, the point about explaining things to people before you know, before or during or while they're feel while they're feeling the tactile is really important. But uh, a caption, uh, this is something Jeff was alluding to, is that you can't just show a picture of something and expect people to really understand what's in the picture. Yeah. So do you, you know, I'm, uh, are, is a Braille caption at a picture a crucial thing to have, e even in a planetarium show? If, uh, you know, I mean, explaining things verbally is, is quite good, but a caption is uh, does that replace explaining things if you really can't be in an environment where the explanation is possible? Like for instance, an exhibit. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yes. Uh, you, that's why you know, touch the stars has has text to describe the cat, to describe the pictures. So, you know, it's not just a, a set of pictures, but um, let's pull it out here. But if somebody's reading Touch the Stars, you know, they're reading text too in print or braille. Um, so as far as, um, I mean, the, the best thing to do would be to have a picture. Well, the easiest thing is to have Touch the Stars in the, in the planetarium with you, but to have a picture that has a braille label. But keep in mind that not all people who are blind are reading braille. It's really, there's really about a 10% literacy rate. Oh. And so a lot of people who especially have um, lost their sight are using um, text to speech. You know, they're 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 doing that using screen readers on their computers. Um, so this, you know, being able to speak and describe the images, I think, are very good. And now I, I thought you were going to talk about captions for like captioning, because I was going to say that, you know, if you're um, handing somebody a picture and as we said it, uh, tactile pictures are good for sighted um, learners too if you have a situation where somebody is um, hearing impaired or deaf the a quick thing you could do is to have google live transcribe on your cell phone and bring it up because when you talk it will say exactly what you're saying and it might have a few typos um, if but you know you'll you'll get the information across Otherwise, what people used to have to do is pull out a paper and pen, but you putting it on your cell phone makes it very easy. I think it does not work for the iPhone. Unfortunately, it's, it's an Android one. Hopefully something will be come out for the iPhone, but, but that's, or have a, an iPad that you could just, you know, click it on it, a, a, just a, you know, a simple iPad, be able to, to do that too, or, you know, a tablet. That's what a lot of a lot of planet terms are using now. They're just having a tablet available or asking people to load uh, Google Live Transcribe on their phone and be able to use their own device during planetarium programs. Um, when I when I worked back in the Museum of Science, getting the captioning system in there and you got it, the race it, involved, in here. it involved mm -hmm. having, you know, we had a it had to be pre-recorded shows that we couldn't get it to work live. Um, we tried it with the dragon naturally speaking and that's a software that medical professionals use where you have to actually articulate punctuation so here is a here is the planet pluto period can you see it question mark and i would some you wouldn't be talking like that in the planetarium and so with the captioning system that was working in boston uh, the script was sent over to WGBH Boston, where they made a program that then sent back, and then we loaded it on, and then the captions would be flashing. Actually, the captions were always flashing, but not 
if the device wasn't on there, the, the captions were always being sent out, but only flashing when the device was put on for the person. So we always anticipated for every planetarium show there would be a deaf person. Uh, and that was that was a great thing about it. Just snap on the caption device and then and then the show went, but it was only for pre-recorded. Now with something like Google Live Transcribe, you can have a conversation with somebody or you could text, you can use your text option on your phone to communicate too. So there's there's a lot more um, options and it's really simple using your own device and the other person's device. This uh, this was related to, I, I have to mention that uh, before we started this, I was mentioning to Noreen, I read her article in the Planetarian, the current issue of the Planetarian, which is about this subject. Um, it's not, not for blind, but for deaf. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, uh, let's see, Rosemary with her dogs barking says, this is a technical braille question. Uh, can you feel a number, say 10 and understand that it's a number in braille? Yes. Yes. That, yes. That's a good point. There is a symbol that looks like a backward L. And so, uh, numbers are letters, but with the backward L on it. So that indicates number sign. So when you go into a, an elevator, take a look at the buttons. You will see next to the um, number what looks like a visual backward L and then some braille characters. So like number one, like one would be number letter A, like that. Number two, number sign, letter B. And then this is a quick question from Sarah. Did, is Touch the Invisible Universe available for purchase? No, uh, unfortunately, the, the NASA books have gone out of print. And so, but what is available is Touch the Stars, which I think has the most opportunity for you to make a good match between your planetarium shows and the, the images that are in here because the um, NASA books were on specific subjects where Touch the Stars is more of a general astronomy book covering many topics. And that's where you go to your website to get that? Yeah, actually, you can go to my website. It will link directly over to National Braille Press. And National Braille Press is the one who is selling copies of Touch the Stars. So if you go to my website and you click the link, it'll take you right to National Braille Press. Okay, I just put that link in the uh, your mm -hmm. website in the chat. Jeff, you're, you're next. Yeah, just a couple of things. So so first of all, something that I've been experimenting with is 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 using my headset, my Bluetooth headset, like the one that I'm using now, connected to a, a wireless mobile device and doing the Google Translate that way. That way, when I'm saying, giving a tour or something, um, they can be having it in their hands while I'm talking and I can be wirelessly transmitting mm -hmm. the text there. So uh, that's had, mm, I've only tested a couple times, so but it, it seemed to work well. well. So it's, it's getting better and better in terms of the technology. Mm -hmm. And then Noreen, I, I wanted to ask something before we um, reach the end of the hour, which is, I'm a big believer in the see it to be it mentality. Do you have particular people in your head in your head that you point to and say, astronomy really is for everybody? These are people who are visually impaired, but who are doing real astronomy at NASA or or, or elsewhere. Do you have a list of people like that that you point to? Um, I, I can, I I can, yes. Um, and actually, one of one of the my favorite people to point to is somebody who's not working at NASA. But she, I met her when she was 12 years old. Her name's Chelsea Cook, and she's, a, I think, a graduate student now. But she graduated from Virginia Tech in physics with honors. And when I met her at 12, when she came to um, touch the Sun uh, media event at the National Federation of the Blind, she told me she was going to be the first person on Mars. And I believe it, you know. So I have met people through the National Federation of the Blind who are... Um, you know, they, they are taking science. In fact, one of the last conferences I went to, they have like um, a STEM, uh, they have little groups and one, one of them is science and engineering. And we, we go around the room and everybody, you know, introduces themselves because otherwise you wouldn't know who was sitting there. And I, I remember that some students were in front of me and they, you know, they introduced themselves and then it got to me. Then I was sitting in the next row and I introduced myself and suddenly chairs turned around and they said, that's you. I have your book. I'm in science because of you. You know, and I'm like, whoa, you know, so those kind of things happen to me. So yes, I, I, I have, I'll refer to different people, but also, uh, you know, I say you can do it. 
you know, you, you really can do it and people believe it and they are doing it. And so, I mean, I feel really good about it because it's way better than what happened in 1984 when, you know, the planetarium was not accessible and people weren't thinking about it. Um, people are thinking about it and people are doing it. Okay. So there's nothing magical about the hour. Um, but before people do start to go, uh, I wanted to say one more time, if you came in late and didn't sign in, that is put your name in the chat and where you're from, could you do that now? And then John had his hand raised before and then he forgot his question and now he's raised his hand again. <laughs> <clears throat> well, my first question was answered during the course of other questions. Ah, okay. Um, but this is a new one. Um, the few times I've done programs with an ASL translator, I quickly realized that the participants were dividing their visual attention between watching the translator and looking up at the dome. And so had to make time um, for them to see and then see again something different and then look back to the other thing. I assume that's a similar situation with the translators well, that that's, that's 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 it i mean you do you do have to make an adjustment on your presentation if you have a, an interpreter in and if you if you have a group coming from you know a school or something if you can send them a vocabulary list or a script or something in advance because sometimes there aren't direct translations of astronomical terms and they have to finger spell which is what takes the long time you know they can say, yeah, you know, this is a, a star making machine that for the planetarium projector, but they may not be able to talk about, you know, the Carina Nebula or something that they need to fingerspell and that just physically takes longer. So I was, you just have to give them that little extra time. I was wondering if there's any corresponding issue with visually impaired people that someone like me might not have thought of. Uh, the, if you can describe things in terms of something that is familiar, uh, for example, Amy was saying when she passes out the tactile panel for the uh, Carina Nebula, no, not the uh, the pillars of creation, I think that's what you said, that they are like finger-like. If you can put something in a very literal term that is familiar to people. So the Big Dipper is shaped like a spoon with a very bent handle. Maybe you you have one of those if you ever put a spoon into a frozen ice cream and try to pull it out, the handle bends. I bet we all have one of those big dippers at home. You know, something something like that, that is going to be some, describe it in a way that will be familiar to people. That makes sense? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So uh, this has been really an amazing I'm not cutting off the questions uh, at all, but we're going to take a, a minute to announce what the next um, what the next planetarium Zoom seminar is. This is a a, pre a preview, sneak pre not a sneak preview. It's just what's coming up uh, on April 26th, which is the last Friday in uh, April after the eclipse. Everybody should be back home. Uh, Jeff Nee is going to be leading us in in a, a, a session called, the title is Layers All the Way Down, Practical Conversations About Multimedia Editing for Informal Educators. Jeff, did you want to say anything about what that is? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just basically because we've done a couple of sessions here and there about about 3D modeling, about Blender, about, about you know, mom, photo editing, GIMP, all that, all of that stuff. And Rosemary and I just thought it would be nice to just have a, a conversation about, to address any questions that people have, to really help people get started if they, if they haven't gotten started yet, because it's a really valuable skill set in, especially in the plan time world, to be able to edit and adjust your own imageries and images and your own multimedia. So that's just that session. And, and I'll be showing some new things that I've been working on as well. And then in May, uh, at the end of May, there's going to be one on preschool children in the dome. And that's going to be by a, a team of from uh, Cal Academy in San Francisco. Um, 
So that's what's um, coming up. And I, I just have to invite anybody who wants to lead a seminar is welcome to lead a seminar. You know, just contact me or Rosemary Walling uh, and we'd be happy to have you. Uh, okay, Matt, you had a, something to say. Thank you. Um, I've put a link in the chat again. I don't know how well this show is known outside of Europe. You maybe already do know it. Um, the Audio Universe Tour of the Solar System show is great. Um, and if you want role models, this is a great show for role models because it's narrated by a blind astronomer who is Dr. Nick Bonn, who's at the University of Portsmouth uh, in the south of England. Um, uh, thoroughly recommend it. It's available on uh, ESO. Um, so, yeah, the uh, the link's in the chat. I, uh, I think it's great. Great. Excellent. And Rosemary, what, uh, how are your uh, dogs doing? Uh, every now and then they're okay. Um, I just wanted to add that the May show is uh, Cal Academy and also the uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific. Ah, uh, we have people yes. from both of them on that. Thank you. Okay, well, this is, you know, this... This has been an unusual seminar, Noreen, because your 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 presentation was shorter than most, but it led into the most one of the most uh, interesting and deep conversations. Uh, so that uh, that's an advertisement for having keeping it short and allowing for questions, uh, allowing plenty of time for questions. It's good, and thank you, Noreen. This is this is great that you. Uh, you uh <clears throat> graced us with your knowledge about this you are you are a recognized master in the planetarium world <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um yeah if any if you want to unmute and applaud or <laughs> this is the time to do it and i'm going to stop the recording <laughs>